presentation I put together, I've, I've called it a very brief introduction to virtual reality because it, it doesn't really cover all too much in any real detail. But I wanted to give, um, I wanted to give people an idea about the different things that the different things that I sort of think about when I start to introduce the concept to people who are new to it or even a little bit familiar. So we'll look at it as some different forms of definitions. Um, also, I, I've got a section which basically looks at virtual reality over time. It's not the history of VR, but it sort of presents the different pr progress that's been made technologically most, most, um, mostly. And then we look at the technology and technology is in brackets because I know Emanuele has a lot to say about technology, the word technology, what it is. And in this sense, I, I'm just, um, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll explore it dur during that time. And then I, and I look at it from a research perspective. There's one particular piece of research by Mel Slater, which we'll look in, in a little bit more detail and look at how that can impact, uh, those findings can impact um, educational applications of virtual reality. And then we look at some applications in, in, in VR for learning. And in particular, one example of my research master's thesis actually, which I did for the educational technology masters at Tartu, we'll have a look at a, at a VR um, learning environment that I designed and did some research on, uh, as well as what I'm sort of currently working on. So in terms of the defining virtual reality, this is a, this is a very big um, discussion point on the project I'm working on at the moment. As part of my, uh, my PhD research, I'm, I'm working for a project which is actually called the, uh, instead of using the word virtual reality, it's coined as uh, immersive, immersive learning environments, let's say. And that can include all sorts of different types of virtual reality or types of immersive learning environments such as, so the obvious ones, virtual reality, augmented reality, but also serious games, um, even simulation-based training, things like this. And I guess a lot of the differing terminology used, I think is partly because the way the culture uses virtual reality is very different to how it was originally coined in research. And here we can see a, um, the reality virtuality continuum, which was a concept developed by Paul Milgram. And it really uses another term, which has become more popular as well, which is the term of mixed reality. And Milgram really used mixed reality to describe this continuum between the real environment and the virtual environment. Um, and that has kind of sort of continued into this, the reality spectrum. So in the left, we can see the real reality. And I'm not sure if, Emanuele probably recognizes that building. And for those of you who, who or if you do actually go to Tartu um, in the, for the summer program, I'm not sure if you're gonna be able to with the COVID happening, but that is the, that is where, I'm pretty sure that's where you, I, I sort of went to collect my uh, thesis upon graduation. So that's a Tartu University yeah, building. Exactly. Yeah, exactly, Tartu University main building. Uh, so very nice building. Um, and in the middle, we have the augmented reality. So this is where 3D objects, computer generated 3D objects are overlaid onto the environment. And we can see this sort of left image is, this is a, an employee, a worker of some sort wearing a HoloLens. This is a Microsoft um, head mounted display for augmented reality. This is often also confusingly sometimes called mixed reality, even though if we remember, we go back here Mixed reality was used to describe a whole range of um, concepts. Uh, and to the right, this is like a mobile phone based augmented reality where the, th where the objects are overlaid in a real environment. In this case, um, it's actually Pokemon Go, which um, is yeah probably one of the largest phone based AR applications in the wild. It's is very successful. And to the very right, which is sort of how I call virtual reality is, is this using head mounted displays. So this guy it's, might be a bit small, but he's wearing a uh, HTC Vive and he's using it to learn how to operate a crane on a ship 
or no, it might even not a crane on a ship. Actually, he might even be operating the ship itself. But the key thing about virtual reality is the entire real reality or the real world is occluded from view by the head mounted display. So you have two screens sitting in front of your eyes. And this uh, image here, this bottom right hand corner one is of a uh, lab star, which is a, an environment developed by a, uh, well, a chemical or chemistry education environment initially developed for PC. And then they sort of ported across to um, virtual reality. This company has recently been brought by Google. So it'll be interesting to watch how that sort of develops. But the difference really is that the, the virtual environment is in, all encompassing in virtual reality. That's uh, why it's called uh, immersive because there's nothing, there's nothing else. You are literally immersed yeah. as if you're swimming, you're swimming in the sea. Exactly. However, if you do look at immersive learning environments, that could include environments such as Second Life. So in the research, immersion is also used in these, in these different ways. Um, and then we get to the immersive computing spectrum. And this is from the, well, a keynote from Google I.O. maybe two or three years ago now. Uh, and here we can see this sort of this as we move towards virtual reality, we get a greater input from the computer generated environment and the real world slowly moves behind. And um, so, so this is an example of the immersive computing um, world as a, as a spectrum. Uh, now thinking about virtual reality over time, we can see that, sometimes it comes to a surprise to people that actually it, it has been in development for many, many years. And even at the end of the, uh, end, end of the 1800s, there's even an example of a device where you would hold a, some type of object to your head. There would be sort of a, an image that was placed in front of two little screens and you just looked at this photo and this was trying to create this form of immersion. But then when we get to this computer generated uh, virtual reality, we can, we can see things like the sensorama. You can Google that to see what that looks like. But then as we sort of go along, we can see that the flight simulator and um, VR simulator for astronauts, this very expensive, high end, difficult to do with technology, um, types of virtual reality, very expensive. That was where it started. Uh, so lots of use in the military, for example. In trainings. Non trainings, exactly. Trainings. Yeah, yeah and, and that's the interesting thing about virtual reality as well. It really did start off as a tool for learning. Um, at least w the early research really was ar around that. At least some of it was, or a lot of it was. Then we had in 95, Nintendo tried to release, well, did release the Virtual Boy, which is a commercial failure, but we can already see that from a lot of the science fiction novels that did talk about this, uh, this, this, this world that might be able to be computer generated, it was starting to hit the consumer market. But it, what really wasn't until 2000, uh, um, 2012 with the Oculus Rift and the Development Kit 1 version, which was a I'm not sure if this one was on Kickstarter, the DK2, which was like the follow-up, definitely was on Kickstarter. But this was developed by Palmer Lucky, and this really kick-started the new era of virtual reality. Low-cost, consumer-friendly, and um, I think one of the reasons why it was the the cost was reduced so much was because we have these we have these mobile phones, and if you ever have tilted your phone from horizontal view to uh, vertical view or vice versa, the screen is able to rotate. So there is an argument to say that because of this tiny little piece of technology that was then built on um, at mass produced, then the cost of that little gyrometer, I think it might be called. Gyrometer, yeah, the gyroscope, yeah. Yeah, the gyroscope. That is also what's used in these early versions of the Oculus Rift, which enabled the head-mounted display to be tracked to the body. And before that, there wasn't this mass-produced, mass easily accessible gyroscope for that type of thing.
And this is very interesting because we have the combination of technology and the commercialization of technology. So the technology was there, but it couldn't be commercialized because the price was too high. But the moment in which there is an innovation in the way in which we commercialize technology, then there you go. There is a technological innovation because then people put more resources into, into the production of such technological objects. So yeah. it's a mix. Exactly. It? Yeah. And then unsurprisingly, mobile VR, which is actually placing a mobile phone inside a headset such as the Samsung Gear VR, that looks like it might even be its own um, its own sort of, that might be the trajectory that the VR was going to go down. And it hasn't looked like that's going to be the case. In 2016, we saw the launch of a lot of um, main, sort of the really first consumer available devices, not development kits, not little Google cardboards or things using your phone. This is really uh, the full, headsets that have been developed. Um, the HTC Vive, which has seen a couple of iterations, obviously the Oculus Quest, uh, sorry, the Oculus Rift, which was purchased by Facebook for a billion dollars or something around this. So this is really when we started to see mainstream VR. Um, I wouldn't say mainstream, but the consumer friendly VR devices to be released. And between 2017 and 2020, we saw it's pretty much the second generation of, of head mounted displays. Um, so we see here valve corporation developed their own VR headset and their aim with this one really was, uh, for gaming and some differences around that is the refresh rate, which is really how many times per second, the screens refresh that you're looking at, which really makes a difference when, um, moving quickly through the scene. It can reduce simulation sickness and things like this. The big, um, the big thing with the Oculus Quest, which is this one, this was a low cost, all in one device. So a lot of the other devices, nearly all of them needed a separate computer or in the case of the PlayStation, the PlayStation 4 to run the VR. Unless of course you were using a device which is run by your mobile phone. But I guess one of the benefits of Facebook who has quite questionable um, business practices, they, the fact that they invested all of this money, they really were able to develop this fantastic device. And one of the key developers around here is John Cormack. And he, he is this sort of visionary in a lot of um, computer, in the computer gaming space. So just as we saw computer games leading the, um, leading the, development of things like the graphics card, again, computer games are leading investment in, in virtual reality, even though education and training is still, it, it has immense, um, immense benefits for that sort of area. The Pimax and the Vario, what's interesting about this one, the Vario, I think is, uh, I want to say Finnish or Swedish, um, but this has very high resolution images. So they're looking for, I guess the point about this thing is the different headsets can help with different types of applications. So they're just the same way as you might use at a school, you might use an iPad in a very different way than you would use a notebook computer or a small laptop. The VR devices are also starting to have these different things. The Oculus Quest has a lower refresh rate, but it's portable. The Valve uh, Index has very high refresh rate, However, it's very expensive. What's the price range of all these toys? <clears throat> Starting so, from Oculus. Yeah, Oculus I think is about 400 euro uh, and that's completely ready to run, put on your head. Uh, 400 euro and of course, all the, the cost of all Facebook tracking all your data. You have to take that into account as well. Um, and then the Valve, I think the total bundle with the uh, light houses, which basically track the positioning as well as the controllers might be 1100 euro or 1200 euro. I'm not hundred percent sure. So more than and a the, thousand. Yeah. yeah. And the Vio, I think it's similar. And I, um, and also I guess another thing to mention is there's, there's a variety of different tracking options here. So inside out and outside in there's two different examples. You can sort of find out about those. 
Uh, the Pimax is very wide field of view and 4K resolution. I think that's the claim anyway. Uh, and, and that might even be 2,000 US dollars, maybe something closer to that, or even 4,000 depending. What's not on here is, is uh, an, another example of the Vive Pro, with, which also has eye tracking, which can also be quite interesting for, for researchers. And that uses Toby eye tracking, which is a, um, it's a well-known eye tracking uh, system in, uh, in, in research. So this is a broad sort of uh, picture of how we've seen the, the, the technology progress over time. Would you say that uh, at the moment, uh, the main use is uh, gaming or, or training is still, still one of still so, the, main, the main purpose? Yeah, I, you know what? I, I don't actually know to be honest, but for me, I actually play, well, more recent, last, last uh, couple of months, not so much, but I actually do play computer games, uh, PC games, and, and I have PlayStation 4, so I, I did used to spend a lot of time playing games. Um, so first person shooters or RPG, um, role playing games, these types of things. I don't really play VR very much. I'm much more interested for its use in training. So, but with, with that said, there's started to become some very popular VR games such as Beat Saber people might have heard of uh, and things like this. So uh, it, would be, it would probably be interesting to see and there must be some data out there, yeah. It's also, I mean, the big question now is also how is this COVID-19 isolation working from home thing going to impact the VR market? That's, uh, that's another question on, uh, that a lot of people have. Yeah, I understand that. So I also want to talk about a little bit about virtual reality uh, in research. Now, there's a couple of different ways we, can, we see it emerging in research. Firstly, there's the, you know, the technical research. So, okay, which displays are best to be used, which are easily cooled and things like this. You know, so there's a computer science aspect. Then there's the um, psychology aspect. So the great thing about virtual reality is you can really control for pretty much all conditions in a sense. So there's this advantage that psychology has. And this was written about in, in, in psychology theory well before the con consumer grade VR was available. And there was quite a lot of universities doing research with these $10,000, $20,000, $30,000, $50,000 um, virtual reality um, setups um, because you would be able to control all environmental aspects yeah exactly so it's yeah. not about training or learning but it's just that you can have a small laboratory uh, and which which is which which you are in total control of and that exactly. would actually make yeah that would make it much easier to run to run yeah. a psychology experiment yeah and i think another point is you can basically build this experiment this experimental design and you can virtually email it to another set of participants in another country for different ages and enable to replicate the methodology being used, it's much easier. So you can also get the, I mean, one of the problems with psychological research is, or research in psychology is, you know, it's often, the, the subjects are often psychology students who are undergraduates at university. An American. So, an American. An American, exactly. So if you're able to democratize the access to the uh, participant base, then you can get more generalizable results, let's say. That's one of the arguments. Uh, and then, and then an, another type of research in virtual reality is the research which is related to immersive learning environments, which is what I'm, which is what I'm interested in. And, um, and, Today, I want to look at one specific piece of research, which is actually from that field of psychology, but I'm also interested in how we can take that research and apply it to learning um, and education and things like this. So the experiment was called an experimental study of virtual reality counseling paradigm using embodied self-dialogue. Now embodiment is one of these key terms 
that you can come across a lot in, in virtual reality, along with presence and immersion. Um, and embodiment relates to embodied cognition. Um, and this is all things you can sort of, you can, you can take a look at yourself. It's quite interesting. Um, and e even jumping on the Wikipedia pages of those different terms is, 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 is useful. It's so just, the three terms were, or are embodiment, immersive, and immersion presence. and presence. Exactly. Yeah. And Would maybe you say embo embodied cognition, if you also want to look embodied at cognition more carefully. Yeah. Yeah. The, which means that the role, the role played by our body in yeah. cognitive tasks, exactly. in, in tasks that we would consider uh, or that would involve uh, high cognitive functions. Exactly. And how about presence? We didn't Pre define it. Yeah, so presence is the, the act of feeling like you're really there. It's similar to a feeling that you're there. Okay, yeah. that you're there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I would, you say, would you say that we are present to one another now, although we are not in virtual reality? Well, I don't feel like I'm really there with you. Okay. Whereas in, in virtual reality, you would say, and then we, we're going to have an experiment. In virtual reality, in theory, you would have that, along with uh, being immersive uh, and, uh, and uh, present with your body. Yeah. And I think one of the arguments is in, as it relates to learning or education is that if you feel like you're really in that environment, then you can become more engaged and more engaged learners tend to lead to greater learning outcomes, things like this. Um, but I we, didn't see go... why, we see why educationalists uh, are, in, are then interested in virtual reality, because of course, if you get the students engaged, as you said, it's likely that something positive will, ha uh, will, yeah. will happen. Or yeah. there is the potential for. Yeah, the potential for, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So let me briefly describe this, this, uh, this experiment. It was done by uh, um, uh, a man named Mel Slater. I think at the, I don't know if the name of the university is this, it's University of Barcelona or it's a Barcelonian university, but he's, um, he's quite influential. It's very, a lot of very influential results from his research. And this is just one of them. Um, so, this was basically the problem statement. So when faced with a personal problem, people typically give better advice to others than to themselves. Um, so this is a problem. So what the researchers wanted to find out then was to see if through the use of VR, a single participant could have a conversation with themselves by swapping between two virtual bodies one body being a 3D model of themselves and the other of Sigmund Freud. Then the participants were to explain their problem to the virtual Sigmund Freud and then from the embodied perspective of Freud, see and hear the explanation of their own problem and then give some advice back. And then this alternating between the two bodies, the participants could maintain dialogue. So we're basically having a conversation about with ourselves. However, one version of ourselves is Sigmund Freud. The now, I'm not sure how, how relevant Sigmund Freud's psychological um, theories are now. I think they've obviously had a big, big influence. I'm not sure um, how they continue to be valid today, but that really doesn't um, change anything here. So here's an example. We can see the 3D modeled um, version of the main participant. And then we have Sigmund Freud. So the fact that this mirror is here, I think has something to do with the recognition of embodiment. So how can one recognize themselves in the virtual space? A mirror can sort of trigger that action. So when you move your arm up and right with the, within the immersive environment, then the mirror will also show that. And the same says that the same is the case with Sigmund Freud. So there was 58 participants in the study. So as we said, the condition one was a self conversation condition. So that's the one I explained, but the second condition was where it was actually Sigmund Freud was a scripted responses. So as opposed to you embodying Sigmund Freud, there was just a non-play character, for example, with scripted responses. And the self-conversation method 
results in a greater perception of change and help compared to the scripted. So the, the authors consider the method as a possible strategy for self-counseling. And when I read this, it triggered my thoughts about, okay, how can we use this psychological research and apply it to learning environments? Um, this is of particular interest to me because the research I'm doing in my project, which is looking at basically how we can train uh, employees of high risk organizations, such as chemical plant operators or nurses in a hospital, how can we help them um, with learning analytics to improve their professional performance and their self-regulated learning behavior. And within the theories of self-regulated learning, we have this thing called self-reflection. As probably all educators know, ref reflection or self-reflection is a very valuable tool. So I'm thinking, okay, if we were to, uh, able to put a student in this position, replace Freud with somebody else, maybe their favorite teacher, the principal, their, uh, their parents, I don't know, it'd be interesting to see what, what we could do to help students reflect upon their learning practices in this type of environment. Um, I just have, I just have a question. So basically I'm in this, uh, VR environment and I'm talking to Freud or my favorite teacher, whomever, my friend, you, uh, a virtual you actually, uh, and would, uh, would then uh, my buddy talk back to me or, or how, how would it work? Yeah, so I, I haven't actually done the, ex uh, done the experience myself, but from my understanding, I would share my problems with Freud. Okay. With the buddy, and then, yeah. And then we'd switch. And then Freud would then offer advice on how to deal with those problems. So Based going, on what? Based on what? Sorry, can you go back to the slide where, where we had Freud? Who is actually Freud here? Okay, in, in, in this, in the images? Yeah. So this, here Freud is, when I'm embodied in my own body, Freud is not embodied by anybody. Okay. And then when I finish with my explanation. Okay, so there is I a perspective. to yeah. Yeah. Freud. Yeah, and, then I, and then obviously what I've just said to Freud gets played back to me, but now I'm embodying Freud. And it's very we, clear. With another if, voice, I imagine. With Fre I, Freud's voice. I don't think so. I think they would... Uh, With your own voice. Yeah. Be yeah. Because I think what they do is they just use a recording from yeah. the microphone within the head-mounted display. Yeah, yeah. And, and thinking about the, the initial problem, so when faced with a personal problem, people typically give better advice to others than to themselves. Uh, yeah, because uh, psychologically speaking, and Freud was talking, no, actually Carl Jung was talking about this. There is a projection. So very often we start cancelling other people, uh, but, but we are actually cancelling ourselves. It's just that there is this uh, dialogue situation that we create through projection. Yeah, it might be, there might be a selection bias of people who do counselling or psychology for people who need counselling or psychology. I've always thought this way. Anecdotally, that's my experience anyway. Yeah, 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 I agree. I agree. So, and, and you would say that this has potential also in the educational setting, because of course, teachers uh, uh, and all other learners uh, are usually suggested uh, to engage in some kind of self-reflective activities in which yeah. they can... Uh, turn their own learning practice into an object of, of observation or, 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 or investigation. Exactly. So if we were able to present some form of learning analytics to a learner, and then that can be a stimulus for which the learner can discuss what they're having struggling with, and then asking for feedback, and we switch it around where the learner is then required to give feedback to themselves. Like, well, as you can see, you didn't actually do much study in the evenings of Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, instead you went out to the bars or you went to play hockey, or uh, maybe you can start to balance the amount of effort you put to your schoolwork into the effort you put to your social life. And now I'm not sure what the result of this would be, but the point I'm trying to make is just because there's these three different 
research areas in virtual reality, the technical, the um, psychological, and then the VR for learning or, or, or researching virtual reality learning experiences or environments, we can still borrow quite obviously, I guess, from all of those three different ways. And when we're reading the literature, we should be, make sure that we do consider all of those three different aspects. A quick example of how we can take the technical side of things, there's been some development again by Facebook who've been looking at how to um, project a clear image of an individual's face within the virtual environment. And it's actually face tracking. So they, they can put some cameras that focus on the eyes. That's easy enough. But if you think about the rest of the face, actually quite important parts are covered by the, by the head mounted display. So they can put some cameras on the eyes, some, a camera that down, goes down and covers the, the mouth. And then that can be projected back into the virtual world onto the face of the person you might be talking to or on your own 3D generated face. And then some calculations can be done to sort of predict the bits that are missing. So this is an example. Okay, we can think about that research that's emerging from the technical side. And how can then we apply that type of research to this psychology? So this psychological research and then to a learning environment. So I think this is an important thing that we should consider. And we actually see how technology can help us create such scenario. Because of course, I would say that you were mentioning Freud. I mean, Freud uh, died in 1939 and uh, he did his research in the early part of the last century. So basically, I mean, I'm not saying that we are borrowing from Freud, but I mean, uh, many, of the, many of the concepts that we're using are actually coming from the last century. There is nothing new. Switching from the third, first perspective to the second to the third perspective is nothing amazingly new. But what is new is that we can we can literally create that scenario because of the technology. Technology helps us make something possible, and uh, and it's not that we are completely changing, as I said, the the, the kind of scenario. But we can we can produce it. You, we can make it which is of course different from the second condition, the scripting condition in which we just, uh, we just read something or, uh, or, or we just listen to our own recording. In this case, as you say, there is also the embodiment aspect, the immersive aspect. So it seems that you really, you're really having this conversation with this, uh, with this hypothetical virtual Freud. Yeah, it's the concept of standing on the shoulders of giants. It's not all new, it's not novel yeah. completely, but it's the, I mean, what virtual reality lets you do is transform certain ways of doing things. And do you think that, yeah, transforming something, yeah, please continue. And the, I mean, if we think about educational technology models, such as the SAMA model, virtual reality has some interesting things that can add to that. So again, um, substitution, augmentation, modification and redefinition is a model that we can use to look at how we can transform educational um, so learning uh, tasks with educational technology and virtual reality has a particularly interesting way of um, applying this SAMA model. Because of these three elements that you mentioned before immersiveness or how did you call it immerse immersiveness? Um, no. immer uh, immersion Presence, immersion, immersion, embodiment. presence, and embodiment, especially in these uh, sort of futuristic scenarios in which uh, the, the, the headset can keep track of our uh, eye yeah. movements and all the rest of it. Exactly. And of course, there's many other, um, there's many other areas that, that sort of fit within uh, or, or match those, those um, three themselves, but there's some good places to start. Yeah, yeah, I understand. I understand that. Do you think that, I mean, the question that I had before, I was, I was interrupting you, uh, is, is this, uh, can we actually, uh, I mean, it seems to me that virtual reality can materialize something that we had the previously imagined somehow. What is the relationship between v VR and our own imagination? Can actually virtual reality becomes uh, a tool for, for, for boosting the, our imagination? And if yes, 
in which ways? I think that for some people it probably can and for some people it probably can't. The same way that some people really benefit from going for a walk outside when they're struggling to find define certain concepts or refine their thinking about something, while others might do some gardening. Now, what's interesting about virtual reality is you could basically build an environment that allows you to go for walk outside or allows you to garden or allows you to paint. There's, there's something special about it, but I'm not sure if I'm not, sh I don't think that it is something that is so simple. We can say, yes, it's possible for everybody to boost their imagination. One thing that I found personally though, is when I'm thinking about the design of immersive learning environments, I'm best able to come up with new ideas and refine old ideas by being in an immersive environment. And that's when I really start to, to think, I guess, think differently compared to when I'm just sitting here in front of my computer or, or, or even on a whiteboard. Yeah, that's a very clear example because uh, what I was hinting at is, is this situation. On the one hand, virtual reality can actually allow us to create uh, scenarios that we have already come up with. So I would call it uh, the practical side or the pragmatical side, pragmatic side of it. But virtual reality can also be used uh, as, as a tool for thought or a tool for imagination. And I think that you just made a you just made a very interesting example that instead of having a walk or maybe you have a walk but you can also go to this uh, you can pull on the the headset and you you start trying to 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 come up with new ideas in that environment and in that case it's not just a something pragmatic pragmatic that you're doing it's 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 more epistemic i would say i would use this word because it's about uh, ideas generation the tool helps you think and imagine alternatives, possibilities. One of the challenges I have at the moment with, with um, idea generation in VR is my fluency with the interactions. So being able to write on my whiteboard or being able to scribble some notes on a pen or even type on my computer, on my keyboard, my fluency with that interaction with the device I'm using or the tool I'm using to create ideas is, is much greater than in virtual reality because the intuitive nature of some platforms in VR are still lacking. And it's not even the fact that it is not intuitive or it is intuitive. I just have much less experience with those tools than I do of using some mind maps on a whiteboard. So it's a matter of acquaintanceship yes. and habits and habits which is yeah. also related to embodiment. Yeah, and also there are some fundamental weaknesses in the technology itself, mm -hmm. such as comfort, such as uh, interactivity, that don't lend itself well to certain creation. Yeah. But at the same time, other parts of the uh, technology, it's the opposite. It lends itself perfectly for the creation of 3D, environments or 3D models. This is, this is, and also even this idea of um, flow, the flow theory, this is, there's something about being in virtual reality where all other, all of your senses are perfectly controlled for that one environment. Time goes quickly. You can really focus and thinking about designing learning environments with these immersive learning, with immersive technologies like VR, you are able to really control every aspect of your students' auditory and visual field. There's, they can't look out the window if it's raining or as a big truck drives past. You know, they can't talk to the person next to them. Be that good or be that bad, it's just a reality. If we are to design learning experiences with VR, we can be really intentional with almost everything but not, I mean, what's lacking now is really the physical things. What can they touch within the environment and how representative is it to the real world? That's not there yet. Well, the problem is um, it's, a, it's a critical issue in a way because if you say that everything can be 
purposefully, intentionally designed, well, that means that uh, there is a big load on us, on the teachers, on the teacher's side. And normally we don't control all the variables in our environment, however, for better or worse, for better or worse. However, we have to, okay, let's say that we're teaching a group of 14 year olds on a Friday afternoon mathematics. That is a variable we need to control for when we're designing that learning experience. So although we don't control for the fact that it's 40 degrees in, in, you know, in Northern Queensland, it's in Australia, it's, you know, 98% humidity. Like by looking at you, it looks like it's about that in Tartu at the moment. It's actually very, very, very hot at the moment, especially yeah. in this room. <laughs> so although we don't have control over the environment that we're um, teaching in and where the learning's happening, we still have to design for that environment. It's just the, 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 the tweaks that we make, or obviously we don't always make them, we can't always make them, but we, we probably, a lot of teachers do, even if it's subconsciously, adapt, to the, adapt their lesson plans, even if it's raining outside, teachers often adapt how their lesson is going to progress. Yeah, I mean, I see, I see that there's still a bridge to gap because I understand your point. As a teacher, you would like to be helpful. And normally what teachers do in order to be helpful is to control the environment or at least the tools. We start from the tools and then we try, of course, to get to the environment. So it should be a nice environment. Also, we, took care, we also take care of moods, right? We try to have a nice mood during the classroom or, or a learning activities or a, a learning activity with students. My point was, uh, well, then we have to address uh, the issue of control because you don't want to control everything. Otherwise, you would establish some kind of uh, technocratic relationship with the, with, the, with the learners. So the learners uh, become a machine or a computer that we want to program because what we do with the computers is exactly this. We can fully control them because we have full control of the environment. At least if you are a good programmer, you can control everything uh, um, about the computer behavior, the computer's behavior and everything. You can plug in something, you know, uh, uh, and, uh, and this is actually something that is critical. But I see your point because, uh, and your point was about flow, okay? It's a little bit like being in a tower, which is very comfortable, <laughs> which affords you uh, with, uh, with all possibilities for focusing, pay attention, and so on and so forth, and no, no distractions, which is, which is usually the problem that, that educators have uh, mentioned when it comes to iPads and uh, all these mobile devices, that, that they are full of distractions. Whereas in virtual reality, at least, you have this environment in which you are supposed to focus, provided that you are motivated to do so. But this is another, this is another topic. Yeah, I think what, one, one thing I will add is that even if you decide not to, even if you decide to not control for certain things within the virtual environment, that's still a sense of control. The lack of decision, because you are literally building everything in the environment, every decision you make is a decision about what you allow and what you don't what, allow. What is allowed, yeah, yeah, what is allowed. Yeah, which is, which is as I said, a plus and a minus. That's, that's the thing. So it, in, so it increases, it increases our responsibility, even for decisions that in the past we would not, uh, we would not, we would have not made because we simply lacked uh, the power to act upon a situation. Whereas in virtual reality, if you don't want to have a window, you just shut it down and that's it. Yeah, I think it doesn't increase our responsibility. It increases our ability to um, it increases our ability to control more intentionally. So we, we can be more intentional about what we control. But I don't see it as an increase in responsibility because in the end we're still just as responsible for the learning that happens in a regular classroom as it is for a virtual reality classroom. Yeah, perhaps the difference is that in a real, in a real classroom, you have to tell John, hey, John, pay attention. Whereas in the virtual environment, you can, uh, 
you can do something similar but mediated through the environment yeah it's so, yeah, it's, not, it's mediated uh, yeah it's mediated and some people would say it's uh, more invasive so uh, because because they are not dealing with you they are dealing with an environment which is supposedly uh, inert it doesn't do anything it just tells you there is a wall here you cannot go through whereas you can ask the teacher please teacher can i do this and the teacher can allow the student to do what the teacher uh, what the student wants to do yeah and it must be said that the ability to do this doesn't mean it's going to be good or bad it has no moral standing whatsoever on like virtual reality can be a perfect tool for indoctrination just as it can be for teaching the values of moral philosophy and that's exactly and that's exactly the problem uh, that i was raising concerning responsibility because now we decide whether we want to use it for yes. indoctrination or not that's well that's a very good point yeah i agree then because you are able to control so much well, yeah. allegedly allegedly yes allegedly, allegedly. well that's because why we we're don't, here yeah we don't know what is going to happen if uh, such, uh, such such tool will become a uh, uh, a common tool for learning and teaching. You know, we, we might develop uh, different practices and we may also decide that uh, perhaps uh, we should uh, uh, let the learner design his or her own environment. So it would be not us controlling the learner, but the learner himself or herself controlling the environment. And this is very interesting because once again, educational uh, uh, education comes in so it's not about the technology but what we want and what we value about the educational exchange if we start valuing more students autonomy if we want to be a little bit more democratic within the school environment then we may think of alternative pathways one of which could be allowing the student design his or her own environment according to his own desiderata and that's it yeah, and maybe this is a good chance for me to share an, uh, the learning experience that I designed as part of my master's thesis. This is, um, this is a video that was taken when I was working in a primary school, a bilingual, English Chinese bilingual primary school in Shanghai. Um, and let's see if the audio works. Um, but to set it up a bit, basically I was exploring the way virtual reality can be used as a tool for teaching collaborative problem solving. So collaborative problem solving is, well, at this time, it was a newly introduced part of the PISA assessments. And it really is about having two or more people come together to solve a problem in which alone they cannot solve the problem. So they need to share their own resources come to consensus, come to agreement about tasks. So this first task was a, this was a consensus task, it was called, and basically they were within a virtual reality uh, art gallery and the two students, they needed to agree upon the awards based on, of the artwork based on the criteria that was presented to them. And this is the conversation and, and the uh, interaction the two had. So they are talking to each other. They are, yeah. They are in the same environment? So the environment that they're within is identical. However, they're not sharing the same environment. Physically? The, uh, uh, virtually. Ah, virtually. So, uh, yeah, because it was a collaborative task. Yeah, yeah. I understand. Physically, they are because they're there. Yeah. Um, and so basically, they just... Um, So this is an example. Now, if we think about the, the, the tools, no, if we think about the things that these students are learning, they're learning that they have to negotiate. They need to um, talk to each other. They need to, I mean, one of the big things about this as a tool at a bilingual school, they were required to talk to each other in English clearly. And this, I think there's something about the fact that there is this the occluded view from the real world so maybe they're less worried about people listening to what they're saying, things like this. 
Um, and because they can't see each other, I also think there's an interesting thing about the use of language as well. So this is the first example. So this was purely just, you know, here's 10 images of paintings by fan art of Harry Potter. Now let's look at, um, now let's just put the top eight based on some criteria. Now the second um, example is more complex. This is where they need to come up with a, um, so they're in what look, they're in identical environments, but what they see in front of them is different. So they need to com combine the information they have from each environment in order to come up with a pin code to open a box. So as you can see, they need to sort of figure out how to listen to each other. And there's, it's not clear who should start, who should come next. And it's not clear about, it's not even clear that they have different instructions in front of them. You mean they really have to collaborate to find they, a way to, to coordinate their yeah. actions and everything? Yeah, and the, so this student has the instructions to what needs to happen, and the other student has different instructions. Has different instructions. But only one of them has the instruction. You need the code can be found by arranging four poker cards in the correct order. So this is an example of a collaborative problem-solving skill, and this is where I, this was, um, this the, the the tool I used to build this was basically. A, a tool which you can build virtual environments like you might build a PowerPoint presentation. So for me, I can't code, I can't um, program these environments. I can do very basic importing of models into Unity, but something like this is um, out of my uh, skill set. So there was a program that allowed me to sort of build this very easily. And so this was the research I did uh, with my master's thesis. And I guess one of the important things is, and I'm not sure if we want to get into this, Emanuele, but this is where I actually compared it to a non-VR example of the same task where the same thing was done, except they were using laptop computers. We want, we want to get into this. We want to get into this. Okay. So please continue. Yeah. So one of my big regrets about this, it's not really a regret because I did learn a lot from it, but if I was to approach this research again, I've started to, there's a thing called, I think it's called the media comparison debate. And if you Google that, you can find out more about that. Um, but this is where we're, we're comparing two different technologies when fundamentally that's not so useful because it's not clear about what learning outcomes is produced based on the technology, whether or not it's a design of the um, learning task or is it the technology itself? So, and I think this is part of my naive approach to educational technology and research is, and a lot of people have this, is that if we want to find out what's better, VR or VR PowerPoint or computer desktop PowerPoint, and we can create learning environments around that. And that's something that I did here, which I wish I probably hadn't have, but it, it, was, an, it was an instructive experience that I went through. What would be the alternative? So the alternative would be something like looking at value added components of the VR environment. So like we said earlier, in this, the, in this, both of these examples, the players are not sharing the same virtual environment. So they can't see themselves in the virtual world. All they can do is hear each other because they're sharing the same physical space. So can, control group and the experiment or the group one and group two group one could be sharing the same physical space but not the same virtual space and group two could be sharing the same virtual space as well as the physical space so the value added component being the sharing of the same physical space and an example why this might be practical is that if you wanted to teach people how to collaborate from two different cultures um, from two different parts of the world, 
you would be able to put them into the same virtual space without sharing the physical space. So is there a benefit for that to design learning environments that have that? Or can you not have them sharing the same virtual space because maybe that's computationally less um, intensive? So it's just as easy to have... So it's, it, it is also okay just to have the audio going from one, um, one position to the other in, instead of also the uh, location data of the individual in the virtual space. But can we say that then technology provides you with different options? I mean, in this case, the VR experience is not, a, let's see if it's better than going to the, going to the museum for real, okay? Uh, I would say that going to the museum would be a little bit more complex and perhaps also more interesting. But the thing is that you can have, uh, uh, you can make them do something different which, uh, which means that, of course, the variables that you are playing with as a teacher in order to facilitate co collaboration to happen uh, uh, are different. So you are playing with different, with different tools. And this is actually very good because instead of asking, is this better than this? You can say, well, I can have both. I can go to the museum and I can have this in which I can manipulate some of the variables so that they are, they are actually doing something different. And I really liked in this experiment, in this, uh, in this particular example, the fact that they were actually sharing the same environment, but at the same time, they were not in the same task environment. And very often it's said that uh, virtual reality isolates people. But in this case, it's used pedagogically because you want them to go through a pedagogical experience, a learning experience that you would not have the chance to have otherwise. And I and think can, that this is a very important point. Yeah, and we can easily iterate and provide different um, in rich environments at the click of the button to change one from the other. If we were to do, the, to do this in a physical space, which we very well could, and we could make some fantastic, um, fantastic learning experiences using the same components and concepts of these, this sort of uh, learning experience design. But logistically, it is so much more complicated to have a, a room for two people set up to go to eight different paintings and talk about it. Well, it yes. Yeah. It would also be a fantastic learning experience, but there's so many opportunities, there's so many um, so much value that virtual reality can offer in relation to instructional design because it is so flexible. Yeah, and this would still be a sort of a, a pragmatic argument. It's easier, it's more convenient, which is of course very important because you can't go to the museum every day. I understand that. But I was, what I was stressing, and I think that this is the point, is that it's something in addition to and, and then comes convenience. I totally understand you. We have lack of resources often uh, and, uh, and, and we manage to do this. And by the way, speaking of which, I would like to ask you one question because in that example, you see the people in the same, uh, uh, in the same physical environment. But I know that virtual reality can also be connected to the internet and therefore mm -hmm. we can merge two great technologies uh, digital, uh, the, the, the online experience, so through the internet, when we meet uh, over the net, and, uh, and the virtual reality. Perhaps we can wrap up on this topic. And uh, I would just like to know your, uh, your, own, uh, your own thoughts, because we had this period of lockdown, and uh, we, were, we were not sharing the same physical environment, whether we were teachers, learners, lecturers, uh, or just workers. And we had to rely on mostly on Zoom, Skype, or all these online, um, online, online tools. Virtual reality can actually be used uh, to create uh, what I would say better online experiences. So perhaps you can just uh, tell us your 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 opinions and observations on this, because I know that there is there are actually tools, applications that allow you to meet another body online in a virtual environment and perhaps you can just tell us what are the pros and cons or or just your own your own experience yeah so part of the phd project i'm working on i work with four other researchers in a smaller group and 15 in a larger group 
and the, the smaller group, the four, the five of us, we have spent some time meeting in different virtual reality platforms and Emmanuel A and I have also done the same. And it's kind of a mixed bag about how useful it is. And just like you will, just like you use an, uh, a tablet compared to a desktop computer compared to a laptop in different ways, or maybe a better analogy is you use, um, you use Zoom differently from how you use Microsoft Word, a collaborative document, it's the same. So there's definitely some value to be had in meeting in, a, in an online space um, in VR. The sense that you get with what is called social presence when you meet somebody in VR for the first time, there's some applications where you can sort of high five each other. I distinctly remember that first time I did that with somebody or well, somebody started talking to me who just like zoomed, you know, teleported over to me. I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was a strange phenomenon to sort of experience. So there is something special about being able to have that social connection remotely, much different from the connection you get on Skype. However, certain things it still is just not good enough for because you are being represented as an avatar, a virtual avatar, it is not photorealistic um, um, imagery that you miss things that you do get on Zoom or Skype or what have you. But the key thing is that just like we we're talking and just like any learning experience, it's really like, what are you going to use the tool for? What is the meaning going to be? Is it really need to be super productive? Do you need to take notes? Can you touch type? Uh, what headset do you have? Uh, what is the internet connectivity like? Um, there's all of these things we also need to take into account, but the value is only going to, I think that eventually, let's say right now, there's much more use for Skype and Zoom style meetings than there is for VR meetings. But I think it's quick, I don't know, slowly or quickly, probably quickly going to flip to the opposite where there's much more use for the in VR meetings than the non, or at least some type of spatial computing um, assisted meeting space, because then you can really start to get this, again, the feeling of presence and the immersion with other people socially. Do you think that immersion and presence and embodiment are necessarily related uh, to the kind of technological mediation we are, we are in? Can we be present even uh, in a forum conversation? Definitely. Well, forum conversation, I'm, I don't know. Texts? Okay, okay, maybe it's this. Maybe it is simply a spectrum. Forum conversation, do I really feel like I'm there asking that question? I'm not sure. It's funny you ask. I did this activity that we just watched with the PowerPoint and the same thing. And I was given the students a, pr a questionnaire around presence. And there was a non, there was no statistical difference between the feeling of presence in the VR world than the PowerPoint world. And that, that doesn't say a lot, but I do think that if you're in a, in, if you're in a learning in, environment, even on a 2D screen, you can have a feeling of presence. So you don't need the occluded view, the 3D models overlaid on the real environment. What we're trying to do then, what we're trying to do when we want, uh, when we use VR, because we think that in this way, we are increasing the sense of presence. Do we feel that we have to compensate on the lack of, of, of presence? Are we afraid uh, that students will not be so present as they could be? Are we trying to compensate, in other words? I think it depends on what you're trying to do. But like I said earlier, my focus is on high risk industry training and the feeling of presence for a training environment where a chemical reactor is going into an emergency shutdown is vital for the learner to be able to react in the correct way when they're doing it in real life. That is very different from figuring out which order to place the poker cards. Yeah, so essentially we may say this, that uh, if we, I mean, in this particular context in which we're having a conversation, 
the feeling of presence can be triggered by Zoom, by the webcam, by having the webcam on. In some cases, even without a webcam, because the conversation is so engaging that we actually feel this, uh, this, uh, this, this being present together. But when it comes to seeing certain things, experiencing certain situations that are needed uh, in order to be prepared uh, to cope with certain situations, then of course, being in this VR environment can add something, which is not just compensatory. It's not compensating on our lack of motivation or whatever. It's actually ontological. It's about the thing in itself. So we always have to keep this in mind when we talk about presence that yes, in some cases, we're not present because the lecture sucks or whatever the reason is. So even when we add virtual reality, it's just a compensation of something that we should uh, uh, take care of with other means. But when it comes to having actual experiences in certain contexts, then it's not, it's not about our motivation. It's about the thing in itself that we want to try out or, or be trained for. Yeah. So thank you very much, Tim, for, for this uh, walkthrough. It's been, a, it's been a very, very interesting conversations that we had. Most of the issues are, are of course, open, essentially. Uh, would you tell us the name of the project you are currently work on? So the name of the project I'm working on is the European Training Network for Chemical Engineering Immersive Learning. Um, Charming, so it's the Charming Project is a funny little acronym. It's a Horizon 2020 project. And uh, if you want to find out more about it, um, you can check the website at charming-etn.eu. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, I'm not a chemical engineer, but I'm sort of from the educational sciences aspect of it. And I work with chemical engineers and chemists and computer programmers and um, game designers to sort of build out some tools for people who are learning chemistry at primary school, at secondary school, at university, and also those working in the chemical industry. Um, yeah. This is all, I think. So thank you very much, Tim, and I hope to see you in the future. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye.